Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the award-winning Texas history podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise. Thanks for tuning in today for some Texas history. I'm releasing this podcast on March 2nd, 2021. That is the 185th anniversary of Texas Independence, so happy Independence Day to everybody. I've got a very special episode for you on this Texas Independence Day. If you're listening to this podcast, you likely agree with me that Texas history is not just important, But it's also exciting, it's unique, frankly, it's fun. The stories of Texas history are also just great stories. You know, uh, the old saying, the truth is stranger than fiction. Well, nowhere is that more correct than in Texas history. But since the actual history of Texas has so many great characters and plot lines, if you use Texas history as a basis for historical fiction, it gets even better. But writers have to be careful. If you start messing with the true stories of Texas history, you are most certainly going to hear about it. But if you're skilled enough to let the history drive a great story, you end up with some absolutely wonderful works. And there have been some spectacular historical fiction centered around Texas history. And, of course, there have been some big misses, too. So what would you look for if you were to pick a writer to engage in a quest to write historical fiction around Texas history. Well, how about somebody that can not only write great history, but they can also write great fiction? Well, we're lucky. Texas has great writers, and one of its best is James L. Haley. Jim Haley grew up in Fort Worth. He graduated from the University of Texas at Arlington, and he spent some time at UT Law School in Austin. But lucky for us, he decided to pursue writing instead of law. Now, he's written, I want to say, 20 books, and I hope that number's correct. He's won multiple awards. He's won the prestigious Spur Award from the Western Writers of America, uh, which he won twice. He's also won the T.R. Fahrenbach Book Award from the Texas Historical Commission, also has won that twice. He's written biographies, uh, a biography of Jack London, a great biography of Sam Houston, considered by many the best, uh, a history of the Texas Supreme Court, Uh, He wrote a book called Captive Paradise, which is a history of Hawaii. Um, He wrote a wonderful narrative history of Texas called Passionate Nation and has written, along with Marilyn Duncan, a book series called Taming Texas, which provides a history of the Texas legal system for seventh grade Texas history students. So he's done it all. Well, his current project is a series of naval adventure novels featuring a sailor named Bliven Putnam, the main character. And the fourth book in this series is being released today, Texas Independence Day. And the title is Captain Putnam for the Republic of Texas. So I reached out to try and convince Mr. Haley to come on Wise About Texas and talk about his writing process, his research process, the difference between writing history and historical fiction, since he's done both very well. Um, And of course, the role of the Texas Navy in the Texas Revolution and many other things. So today I'm going to present an interview with one of Texas's finest writers, James L. Haley. Enjoy. Jim, thanks so much for being on Wise About Texas today. It's great to be with you. Well, it's an honor for me. Uh, We're recording this podcast in early 2021. I want to ask you first, as a writer, how has the all of the lockdowns in connection with the pandemic, how's that treating you? Are you more productive, less productive? What have you been up to? It was not what I expected. I live alone. I work alone. You'd think I wouldn't care. And, but I forgot I go out for breakfast three times a week just to talk to the damn waiters. <laughs> you know, Have and you- the, I, it has been murder. It has been absolute murder. And then um, every time I start to get depressed, there's somebody posted a meme on the Internet that said Shakespeare's Globe Theater was closed down for plague and they, they couldn't have plays. So he used that time to write King Lear, Antony and Cleopatra and something else. Oh my gosh. I better get busy. (laughs) Yeah. That's a lot of pressure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would have wanted to know that. (laughs) Um, Well, it's a particular honor for me to have you on the wise about Texas podcast. You don't know this now for our listeners, we've known each other for several years, but, but you don't even know this story. You're one of the inspirations for the beginning of this podcast. Now, I'm not going to make this all about me, but I'm going to make it about me for a minute. 
Um, you might recall my very first Supreme Court Historical Society trustees meeting. You were present, yeah. I believe, as a trustee, and Bill Brands was our guest speaker. Oh, I was there. I, I'll do anything to listen to and, Bill Brands. Oh, yeah, he's great. And I was standing there with you and Bill Brands. So I both met you both for the first time, two of my historical uh, literary heroes. And I've only been starstruck one other time, and that was when I met Waylon Jennings. So I'm standing there trying to make small talk <laughs> with these two uh, renowned authors. And it was Brands that did this to me. He looked at me and he goes, what are you working on? And then you looked at me. And I knew the question meant what historical project were you working on? I had nothing. I had no answer, nothing. And that's when I started looking for something to do to give a little bit back to the history community. And that's what started Wise About Texas. Oh, so wow. thank you for that inspiration. Uh, I'm delighted to know that. That goes into my memoirs. So like Shakespeare to you during this lockdown, it's uh, Haley to Wise on Wise About Texas. So I appreciate well, I that. Like my life has suddenly been made worthwhile because you, you know, <laughs> your, your episodes are just marvelous. Oh, uh, well, thanks for saying that. Thanks for saying that. Uh, no money has changed hands for that comment. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I'm, I'm glad I'm honored to have you on the podcast, but I'm especially glad to interview you. Today, I'm going to release this podcast right around the release of your latest book. Now, you're a very prolific author, and, and I'd love to talk about all your books, but I want to talk about the one that's just now coming out because it is a work of historical fiction. You are an excellent fiction writer and an excellent history writer, but you have combined the two in uh, your latest, Captain Putnam for the Republic of Texas. Now, if I'm right, this is the fourth book in the yes, Blythe and Putnam series. So tell mm -hmm. us about that series. Well, Bliven Putnam, uh, yeah, how shall, oh, what a, that's actually quite a, a great story. There was a legendary editor at Putnam, Nita Talblib. Uh, she edited Danielle Steele. She edited Dean Koontz. Uh, and my agent, uh, Jim Hornfisher, was in New York running his trot line, and uh, he had a, a meeting with Nita. Well, what are you working on? Uh, is, is there anything I can, I can put before you in the next year? And she said, well, those wonderful naval tall ship series like Horatio Hornblower and the uh, Master and Commander series, um, we'd love to do one of those, but they're all British and they're all Napoleonic. We would really love to do an American series, um, but we're holding off because we don't know that the American Navy was really doing anything between the War of 1812 and the Civil War. And my agent said, hold the phone. I might have somebody. And I got home from work that day and there was an email saying, call me Opportunity Knox. <laughs> so, Always a good message. Yeah. Uh, and we talked about it. Well, you know, Opportunity doesn't knock very often. So I grabbed him by the belt and yanked him inside. Good. And two days later, I sent them a, a bullet point outline for an interlocking series, uh, buddy stories, two guys, uh, who bond during the Barbary Pirate War as 14-year-old midshipmen. And then the second book was about the War of 1812. Uh, the third book was Among the Missionaries in Hawaii in 1820. And now the fourth one is about the Texas Revolution, which has really been great because the other series, the Hornblower series and the um, um, Master and Commander series, were never intended to be series. You know, one, oh, it's all just enough, so maybe we'll try another one. And so they're a mess of prequels and sequels. Uh, but I get to age my characters through each book and it's just been more fun than a barrel of monkeys well you don't have to answer this but did you did you plan out the series when you when you finally got the deal to do it did you say okay here are the major events into which i'm going to put captain putnam well that boy that really segues us into the art of fiction as opposed to doing history because well, that's doing, what i wanted to talk about but well, so what's the deal for it fiction is about eight times harder than plain old history because you have to know the whole life and so one reason I made my characters from Litchfield, Connecticut. Uh, today, Litchfield is like the number 208th largest city in Connecticut. <laughs> but in 1800, it was the fourth largest. It was the financial, intellectual, educational, cultural capital of Connecticut. Uh, Lyman Beecher, the great abolitionist, moved his whole operation there in 1810, I think mostly for the fundraising. Uh, but he's a major character uh, in, in these early stories. Uh, so there's a plus, it was the scene of um, the, the greatest uh, girls finishing school, Mrs. Pierce's school for girls uh, in the entire country was in Litchfield. And Clarity, who winds up becoming Mrs. Putnam, um, is a product of that. Uh, you may know this. It was also the site of the first law school in the United States. 
Yeah, Mr. Justice Reeve of the Connecticut Supreme Court realized that, well, rather than let somebody come into your office and, as they used to say, read for the law. Read the law, right. The classes, and then I can turn out lawyers like ginger cookies. <laughs> which I don't know. history. <laughs> <laughs> really. So the, the more you know about the culture, the better book you can write as a novelist, because none of that would figure into a straight history. Uh, of the Barbary War. So did you, uh, were you chomping at the bit to write about the Texas Revolution during Captain Putnam's life? Or? Oh, you have no idea. You have <laughs> no idea. Because I had to, the number two character, Sam Bandy, who's the, the best friend, um, I had earlier on, he had to go broke in South Carolina, uh, which was easy enough during the Panic of 1819, mm -hmm. uh, so that he could come to Texas with Stephen F. Austin. So by the time of book four, uh, those 15 years have passed. And uh, yeah, I've been, I've been so looking forward um, to, to doing this. And it was shocking how fast um, the thing. Now, here's one thing about historical fiction. You just have to learn to trust yourself. It's sort of like when Winston Churchill was learning to paint and he set up his canvas on the seashore and he took a little bitty brush and he dipped it in the blue and he's a little bit of blue in there. And an artist friend of his said, no, 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 that's not how you. So he took a big old brush and just started schlepping blue all over the top of the canvas. Well, that's, if you're going to write, you, you, you just have to, to trust your education and your craft. And if you're an artist, art happens. If you're not an artist, a mess happens. And that is the terror that I live with. <laughs> Yes. Now all of a sudden I'm nervous about the next legal opinion I write. So, yeah. um, but, uh, so your, but your first book was not fiction. Your first book was history. Was it not? Uh, about the Barbary war? No, it no was the, uh, I'm going back over the course of your career. out of the Oh series. yeah. Um, oh dear me. Yeah. As a writer. Yeah. The Buffalo war, it came out. Oh dear. Believe it or not, it came out in 1976. Yeah, way back when. And uh, it was a history of the last of the Comanche Indian Wars. And, um, you know, you've done your job when it's still in print 45 years later. Yeah, that's that's a, quite the <laughs> compliment. And you wrote uh, one of the books that I, I get asked to recommend books is to, to non history buffs about Texas history and Passionate Nation. One of your works is one that is always on that list. Oh, bless uh, your heart. Which was a was a more of a narrative history. Can you talk about that aspect of your historical writing? Well, that was very interesting. Bruce Nichols, who um, I, the last I heard he had become the president and publisher at Macmillan, he was an editor at Free Press, a uh, division of Simon & Schuster, and recruited the book. Uh, they called me about it and he said, now, um, there's, there's lots of Texas history out there. We don't want you to go reinvent the wheel and do original sources and all that. We just want Texas history with your edge and your humor in it. And as a way of introducing himself to me, he sent me a copy of um, a book called Lost Prophet. It's a biography of Bayard Rustin uh, from the Civil Rights Movement, <clears throat> which was a finalist for the National Book Award. And I thought, the hell you say, I'd better go back and reinvent the wheel. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not going to be the weak link on your, <laughs> on your list. Uh, so my job, it was sort of a, a Rubik's Cube. I had to one, tell all the relevant history. Two, be witty and often funny. Three, have something new in every chapter that people, oh, I didn't know that. And four, hold it to under 500 pages. Well, like a Rubik's Cube, something had to go. Right. Let me guess, because I know it's longer than 500 pages. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it's like a, a little over 600 pages, which when uh, my good friend Steve Harrigan just did his right. uh, big, wonderful thing. He, he got to write in the Ted Fahrenbach Lone Star mold. I think he got like, what, 900, 1,000 pages, something like that? He got between 900 and 1,000. The listeners uh, have heard him interviewed on this podcast, but but uh, I don't talk about that particular big, wonderful thing in terms of pages. I talk about it in terms of pounds. It comes in over five pounds. <laughs> so <laughs> his is a journalistic history. He, right. he asked questions that a journalist would, would write. And we were sort of in, in desultory correspondence while he was working on it. And um, I kept saying, look, 
every every writer that comes along has their own questions to ask when it comes out don't worry about me i'm going to be first in line to buy it you're not you know i'm not a wolf i did not pee on this territory (laughs) (laughs) well let me uh, speaking of that and maybe not in exactly the same words but what do you consider yourself a a historian a a, a writer of history a a novelist what are you um well you know label yourself for us um i just think of myself as a writer um, you got job. I'll, I'll try and do it. Uh, some of the writers that I most admire, like Peter Matheson, have, have been double threats. They do novels and they do history. In fact, when I began research on uh, the Putnam Navy stories and learning everything I could about the early Navy, probably to this good day, the best book ever written about the first 50 years of the United States Navy uh, was written by, are you ready? Ready. James Fenimore, last of the Mohicans Cooper. I'll be darned. Yeah. Uh, he worked in a Navy office for decades. Uh, but his history of the Navy is still just the best. Even though he was really a novelist. So short, shorter answer, I just think of myself as a writer. Okay. So when you're doing historical fiction then, so you've written the history, you've written fiction, not, not always historical fiction. Uh, uh, probably more often than not, not historical fiction, but you, so you go from what is probably the number one biography of Sam Houston and all of the rigor uh, of primary sources and citations and all of that sort of thing to the novel where it's all whatever, anything goes. Um, How do you do your research? What do you find yourself going more toward the history or more toward the fiction or how does that work in the writer's mind? Well, every time I get stuck creatively about what to do in a story, if I would ever grow up and learn to trust the history, that the history will tell me what to do. Um, I've been stuck in the past. I wrote a novel many years ago about uh, the Tsavo man-eating lions in Kenya in 1898. And I worked on it, worked on it, I sent it in. And my agent said, no, nah, it's a great story, but there's no sex. Well, <laughs> I always heard that that happened and right. I didn't really know what to do because I was a church kid. I, you know, So I went back and I read the memoirs of the governor general of Kenya colony at that time. And I read cultural stuff about the natives. Well, it turned out that the Wakamba tribe had this thing called the Kinyola, which was a protection racket. Whenever there was a plague or locusts or man eating lions, uh, the witch doctor would go from household to household until he found some, um, uh, Single woman, young, poor, uh, nobody cared about her. Well, he would finger her as the witch, and she would wake up one morning, uh, and she'd be the only one in the village, and so she'd do her chores until one of the Morani, the warriors, would sneak up behind her and run her through with a lance. Well, occasionally, uh, one of these women would wake up and be the only one in the village and say, fooey on this, and run like hell. (laughs) <laughs> well, when the British were there, the best thing she could do was join a camp of British railroad coolies because it would be easier for her to join another Wakamba group if she was pregnant, Ah, like buying a cow with a calf. So she would yeah. service railroad coolies. Well, all that gave me a not just a context for sex, but it made the story deeper. Right. And really, really improved it. So when I get stuck creatively, I just look deeper and deeper into the history. I, it, it's funny. One mistake that a lot of beginning writers in historical fiction do, they read about the time and they read about the time and the, the people and all that. That's not enough. You have to read stuff from the time. Right. To get their, the how they use language. Uh, what their social expectations were. You know, when I was working on the Putnam books, um, book tour, I'm, I'm on a train. I'm going through the entire width of Connecticut. Beautiful, deep, dark forest. Uh, and I thought, oh, I've got to do something with, with these beautiful, you know, Robert Frost type woods. And so I got really into it. Well, then I found out that Timothy Dwight, early president of Yale College, not yet university, wrote a four volume travelogue about uh, New England, uh, that I could walk into PCL library at UT. They had them on the shelf and I could just find the one with Connecticut and check it out. It was published in 1818, which shocks me that you can still get your hands on. (laughs) 
Well, it turned out that at that time, the biggest worry and greatest expense that people had during the winter was firewood because they had cut all the trees for farms. Oh. And so how are you going to keep warm in the winter was a big problem. And all that forest that I saw was second growth. So I in oh. third growth. So I very nearly put my foot in it and <laughs> it made a big historical mistake. Oh, and believe me, the readers out there, when you make a mistake, they let they you. They catch you. Oh, boy, yeah. they, they got you. Yeah, I don't get away with anything at the, in, in this podcast that I don't hear about. Uh, right. Which, so you, you mentioned something about the dialect, and that was actually something I noted. There was a great phrase in your book, um, and I believe Sam Houston says it, and he says, that is shall, how we shall have it which I just love that phrase. So tell us about the language research and trying to capture the language of 1820s and 30s, Texas. Oh, 1820s and 30s, Texas. There's so, there are so many memoirs from that era. There's not a a lot of publishing done at that time. But one thing I'm sure you've uh, noticed is that the early numbers of the Southwestern Historical Quarterly from the 1890s are mostly memoirs of people from back then. Yes. Very and, interesting. Uh, I got very lucky once. I uh, uh, curated an exhibit for the state capitals visitor center many years ago, about 150 years since statehood. And so I'm curating this exhibit. Oh my goodness. The toys they let us have for <laughs> six months. We got the only Lone Star flag known to have flown over the Republic. Wow. We got the, the pen that president Polk signed us into the union with. We got goodness. Santa Ana Spurs captured at San Jacinto. Oh, my goodness, the, the toys that we got. Well, I went over to the what was then the Barker Texas History Center. It's now the Center for American History. Uh, and they have the largest existing collection of Texas newspapers. But they want you to use it on microfilm because those things are fragile. Right. And so I talked to the guy and I said, look, if I was looking for one article about one thing, okay, I'll, I'll use microfilm. But I'm doing a whole wall of pullouts from the newspapers of that era. Uh, And I really, really need like double extra secret permission to look at those newspapers so I can just scan what all they have. Well, they let me do it. Oh, wow. And so I had like a 20 foot wall in the visitor center with uh, sort of faded picture backgrounds of newspaper sheets. Uh, and then pullouts in maybe 24 point type of the stories. And newspapers back then weren't just news. They were inspiration. They were poetry. They were fiction. It was like the only reading material people had. Right. So the newspapers from early Texas were full of those uh, early expressions. Yeah. Um, like um, uh, not uses of grammar. Uh, phrases, what people thought was funny that you might, it, it wouldn't register as funny today. Right. Because we don't know what they're, not, what they're talking about. So yeah, well, early newspapers are a big source of that for Texas because there's, there's not many books that were published then. Well, I always get distracted when researching a specific subject in those old newspapers. I'll always start reading around it. Oh, no and kidding. It takes me. Oh yeah. I mean, Anyone I read the ads. Them? I read the ads, especially in the old Texas Telegraph. Uh, about Houston of wh- whose store had what, what yeah. just arrived from New Orleans and that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they didn't have a lot of places, stores that you could walk in and buy stuff. Uh, what yeah, just be on the street. Uh, the riverboat captains would post notices up the streams that, you know, they're, they're bringing their, their little riverboat up the Brazos. And if you have anything to trade, bring your corn and your hides down to the bank. And I've got nails and shoes and lumber. And, you know, they would yep. say all the stuff that they had. Uh, to trade. So that gives you a sense, you know, that Texas was a very bump and rumble sort of economy. There, there was very, very much uh, to change hands. Yeah. That's really neat. Well, you had a lot of knowledge uh, of Sam Houston, for example, who figures prominently in this novel. Um, And I don't want you to give away everything in the book, but there's a a great interplay because Captain Putnam, of course, is a United States Naval officer. Right. We have President Jackson making an appearance and the third leg of that stool being uh, Sam Houston. So yeah. talk a little bit. Was there a little bit of Haley's theory of what might have happened during the Texas Revolution and the U.S.'s <laughs> involvement? Or is it your wish list? Or 
Tell us oh. how you got to where you got to. Oh, dear me. Um, okay, I'm going to give I won't give away the book, but I'll give away a little trade secret. Okay. Uh, I was in Huntsville last March uh, to give the Independence Day speech over General Houston's grave. That is like the greatest honor that Huntsville can give you. Right. So the night before I went to dinner at uh, the home of, of Mac and Leanne Woodward, who he's the curator, the director of the Sam Houston Memorial Museum. And among this group at dinner were two of Sam Houston's nephews, like great, great, great nephews. <clears throat> and uh, during dinner conversation, one of them, we were talking about Houston's delaying tactics. You know, that he's not going to fight Santa Ana head on. Right. Uh, in fact, Houston later, and I, of course, his, there's eight volumes of his published writings and that, that many right. more unpublished. You can't know everything. Even I can't know everything. But um, this fellow said Houston later described his strategy as Fabian. <laughs> I thought, um, well, okay. So I get back to my motel, I get on the internet and I start researching this like crazy because I've got to give the speech in the morning right. about Houston's uh, retreat. And uh, come to find Houston, of course, you know, he was a deep student of history and especially ancient history. And he had studied Quintus Fabius Maximus well, and his it. retreat from Hannibal in 216 BC when Fabius, uh, Fabius would not fight him head on, stretch his supply lines, harry his flanks, wait for an opportunity well, at that time, the Roman Senate was full of people who, who were calling him a coward. You've got to fight yeah. now. Replaced him with somebody else who went out, fought Hannibal head on, and was obliterated. The Roman army was just destroyed. So they put Quintus Fabius back in command. Okay, you, you had it right. <laughs> and he knew that he could not afford to let the government know what he was doing, or they would replace him. You know, it was around the uh, second week of April when he opened that letter from President Burnett saying, sir, the enemy are laughing you to scorn. You must right. fight, blah, blah, blah. That's why he kept his own counsel. And talk about an early expression. He said, if I had let uh, people know what I was doing, I would have been like the mule between two stacks of hay. And not <laughs> turn. Um, so, yeah, I learned things from the family the night before that speech. That, that, that's a very long answer, but no, that, that's, that's, that was one of my keys to Houston was what I learned from the family that I instantly wrote, altered the story to put that in there. Well, one, um, that's fascinating. One thing, uh, how did you research? How did you do your naval research for this series? Because it's, it really, when you read these books, uh, you really feel like you probably could join the crew at any time. How did that come about? <laughs> I've got... One, two, three, four shelves here of early naval history uh, about the U.S. Navy and the commanders and all that shipbuilding. And I, I tell you what, it's really lucky that um, it was for the third book that I got to go to Boston and give a talk to the Naval Order of the United States. And the hotel was in the, the Charlestown Navy Yard. And we got a guided tour of the frigate constitution the next day. Oh my gosh. That would have been and I made such a fool of myself um, because, you know, the hatch in the wardroom down to the magazine was right where it was on the blueprints. And I got so excited and I was <laughs> looking down in there as far as I could, because that's the oldest surviving part of the ship is the powder handling room in the magazine. And I asked the captain, and she's still in commission. She's the oldest Warship in the world still in commission. Oh, I didn't know that. All the ones like the Victory, but they're, you know, they don't go out anymore. <laughs> and I said, I, I thought about writing ahead and see if I could get like double extra secret permission to wiggle down there because it would help me to see, you know, that crawl space uh, yeah. into the magazine and so on and so on. And he said, well, you know, come back and we'll make it happen. But I am so glad that I did not actually see the details on that ship until after I wrote those first two books. Because if I had the emotional connection, there's so much to see and understand, I couldn't have written about anything else. And they would not have been novels. It would have been, oh, and the, the poor docent who was showing, her, showing us around Seaman Gonzalez. You know, I'm, I'm with a bunch of retired admirals and so on and commodores and they're seeing there with their <laughs> legs on their, on their cap. Uh -huh. And he was so intimidated. Uh, I gave him a couple of softball questions. Oh, he even let us go down into the Orlop 
which is the lowest part of the ship, and it's not on the tourist areas. But we let him take it. Uh, he took us down there. And I said, wow, does this mean you're going to let us go up into the fighting tops? <laughs> and he was like, uh, no. Because <laughs> we would need safety lines for that. And I don't yeah. have safety lines. But it was just great. And well, for the Barbary War book, um, you know, online, there's, I think, 4,000 pages of Navy papers uh, about the Barbary War that you can download. And then the trick is to keep writing a story and make sure you write a story and not start quoting documents. You, you can't let the historian take over because when you write a novel, uh, it, it's everything has to serve the story, everything. Every word has to serve the story. Well, are you willing to tell us a couple of things that uh, served the story of Captain Putnam in the Texas Revolution? I thought I might have, might have recognized it some places and events, but I'd like to see what you will let us know about that. Oh, boy. Um, well, he didn't like Andrew Jackson. Uh, he was, that's that's a, a political aspect that we forget. Uh, is that New Englanders uh, really had no use for Andrew Jackson. They were horrified by his, what he did with and to the presidency. You know, his big inaugural party where they, they, they trashed right. the place and they were breaking windows, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So uh, when he, the story opens uh, in Florida in 1834 at the Seminole War, which there's a reason for that because... Um, the fellow who was sent down by Jackson to deal with the Seminoles um, was well known to Sam Houston because they had been in Congress together. So when Blivin comes to Texas and he has his interview with General Houston and sort of badmouths this guy in Florida about, you know, what an idiot he was with the Indians, Houston lets him know, you know, I, I like that man. We were in Congress together. Uh, of course, it's true. He's kind of an idiot. Um, so yeah, there were, there was one of those cases where if I get stuck with a story, I go deeper into the history and the history every time, every time has helped me out and gotten me through, uh, a lump in the story. Well, what's your estimation of the importance of uh, the Navy in the Texas revolution? Captain Putnam in this novel is sent to assist the Texas Navy. Um, but talk a little bit about the Naval operations in the Texas revolution. Well, now that is actually very interesting because when you think about naval battles, you think about ships of the line, you know, trading thundering broadsides across deep water. And, you know, a frigate, the Constitution had 44 guns, but she was really pierced for 60. Uh, a ship of the line, a, a, a first rated ship of the line might have 100 guns. Um, in the Gulf, the two biggest Mexican cruisers in the Gulf uh, had three or four. So these were not uh, Hornblower-esque naval battles in the Gulf. <laughs> so, but the irony is that so much depended on the Texas Navy. I mean, in fact, the, the teaser at the very beginning of the book is a quote from Sam Houston saying, we must, you know, look to the Navy for essential aid, you know, for keeping the, the, uh, the routes open and so on. So it was a different kind of naval warfare. It was as fraught and as um, dangerous and deadly, if you're there, uh, as any other naval battle. There just weren't as many guns involved. Plus, there was politics. Uh, Commodore Moore of the Texas Navy uh, was constantly scheming. In fact, a lot of the officers were, were would-be politicians. Um, so it was – that plays in it, too, because they're having to dodge around uh, – President Burnett, who, you know, one of the aides that he sent to Sam Houston was really a spy to let him know what Houston is doing. In fact, um, when they couldn't catch him drinking, they made up a story about his using opium, <laughs> which wasn't true. Uh, that was Hazard Perry. Well, what Burnett didn't know was that Houston also had a, a spy in the government who was the Secretary of State, Sam Price Carson. who <laughs> was letting him know. I mean, it was the... It was the <laughs> Uh, cluster F you ever saw <laughs> trying to, to fight a revolution because everybody hated each other. Kind of like yes. the Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, tell us, uh, let me ask you this finally. What, what did Captain Putnam learn from his participation in the Texas Revolution? And what's 
what's next for Captain Putnam, if you can tell us? What he learned is that he's really kind of tired uh, because in book one, he's 14 years old. Now, in book one, I made them 14 to be believable. Midshipmen were often 11 or 12. Wow. But nobody, nobody would believe that now. So that's one concession I made. Um, then they're lieutenants in the second book of captain in the third book. And he's still a captain in the fourth book. But now he's, he's getting close to 50. And Clarity has been waiting at home for him all these years. Um, he, there's a reason why I, I put him on a farm in, in, uh, with an apple orchard in Connecticut, which is <laughs> in real life, in real life, um, uh, General Israel Putnam's um, occupation. It was Israel Putnam who brought the very first Vermont russet apples into Connecticut. And that the Putnam family actually did really uh, grow apples and press cider. That was one of the things they did for income. So he really wants to go home. And when he, he wins Jackson's approbation, uh, he winds up uh, being in Washington when, you know, Santa Ana, excuse me, after um, San Jacinto, he is sent to Washington to deal with Jackson, which that was one of the most fun scenes to compose I've, I've ever, <laughs> I bet. ever come across. In fact, here's a little hint for writers. Uh, when I was working on my first novel and I had no idea what I was doing, it was a Western. It was a genre Western for Doubleday. Um, the great David Lindsay, who did the Stu Hayden mysteries for Doubleday and Athenium, uh, went, we went to the same church. And he thought I was great stuff because I was doing nonfiction. And I thought he was great stuff because he was writing these novels, making a lot more money than I was. <laughs> and I said, David, and after church, I went, David, David, wait, stop. I'm stuck. Help me. How do you write a novel? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he looked at me and said, well, Jim, I don't write my novels. I let my characters write my novel for me. <laughs> oh, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, a lot of help that is. Yeah, a lot of help. And he said, no, really, try it. Know your characters, know the situation, but take yourself off the page and just channel what they were do, just stream of consciousness. You know, it's ancient uh, thinking that all the stories are already written. You've just got to tap into them and let them come through you. Try it. Uh, <laughs> and so I was working on this Western and I got home and um, I thought, okay, mm, you know, all right, this is the end of this. And uh, I got up like 15 pages later. It was the best 15 pages I'd ever written. That was the best advice I ever got was wow. to not write. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways to write a novel. You know, you can, you can be um, – uh, age of innocence and you can go you can spend pages on on a person every thought every motivation every feeling they have or you can just let the characters carry it for you which is more of the way jack london would have written it at the same time uh and if i find that it works best for me to let the characters do it now in closing let me say that there's all kinds of ways to write historical fiction i mean you can tell your story and put them in costume that gets you to Braveheart. Right. You know, interesting story, nothing in there actually happened or it didn't happen that way. Or there's lots of cool stuff that did happen that's not in there. Right. Um, at the other extreme, you can research the history and um, invent some dialogue, which isn't very interesting. But there's anything in, in between there is fair game uh, to do it. And I tend to let the characters do it for me. Well, I can I can say I was privileged uh, uh, to be able to read the, an advanced copy of this book. And uh, as a more history oriented person, uh, I found it very insightful in the Texas Revolution, because whether you're, you know, the way the characters wrote the novel for you, uh, as you say, um, I think provided insight into events that people will recognize when they read the book, even though it's. Oh, fiction. bless you, so Ken. Yeah, that's I thought it was I wonderful. Well, I, I, I appreciate that so much because that's why you do a story is that you're allowed to comment in such a way. Uh, can I ask you, can I turn tables here? Can I ask you something? Sure. Were you put off uh, at all by uh, the relationship between uh, Sam and Dicey? I've been warned that I will get blowback about that. I was not. Uh, I yeah. thought that was authentic. That happened lots and lots of times. Okay. Because um, it's in the not public. Correct. Well, I, I say that you now. Know, 
Right. I, I thought, uh, I thought it was just another aspect of early Texas. You know, people want to, people want to disregard, uh, history that they don't like, or they don't yes. feel, you know, for whatever reason, they don't like it. Yeah. They, they think it immoral or not politically correct or whatever it is. And well, they we just ignore it. Whether to do that or not. But you and I know from Texas history, um, Justice Hemphill and his right. relationship with Sabina. And yep. he wound up putting his daughters through Wilberforce University in Ohio. And we forget Wilberforce University was founded for the purpose of giving an education to mixed race children of Southern planters. You know, yep. That's a big part of the history that we just don't like to talk about. So without giving any more of the story away, I'm glad you weren't offended by that. No, not at all. And I, I think, like I said, I think it's an authentic part. Uh, that's authentic history. And, uh, and it made a difference. And, and it just shows or should show the reader uh, how complicated history is. It doesn't fit into the boxes we want to put it in. Yeah, And, and as I sort of presaged by slaves in earlier books, Dicey had her agency. She was making her own decision. Right. Absolutely. You know, uh, geez, you would have been mortally offended to call her a victim of anything. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, Jim, thank you so much for joining Wise About Texas today. Captain Putnam for the Republic of Texas is now out uh, wherever books are sold. I certainly enjoyed it, and I know the listeners will too. And just thank you so much for playing a role in starting this podcast. And finally, five years later, I was able to interview you. So thank you so well, much. Ken, when, when we're all vaccinated and you're down in Austin, lunch is on me. Oh, that's that, that's a deal. And that's now recorded for posterity. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Jim Haley. You can find our Facebook page, Wise About Texas. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas if you get a minute. Leave us a five-star review on iTunes. That helps other Texas history buffs find the show. And if you want to support the preservation and promotion of Texas history, go to patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas. Thanks again for tuning in today, and go out and do something for Texas today. Happy Independence Day. Until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.